we'll start from the notes talking about improving your mentality as a sort of incremental ongoing process. It's not like people arrive at the game and they have an amazing mindset and taking losses is easy, losing streaks, no problem, losing to opponents doesn't affect you. It's really tough, especially in StarCraft when you don't have loot boxes, you don't have like a lot of rewards and achievements you get along the way. Most of the game, if you're sort of a ladder hero, is going to be about 50% wins and 50% losses. And that's pretty damn tough in terms of feeling like you're getting somewhere. Maybe you get promoted once every several months if you're working hard, but a lot of people will stay in the same league for a year or more at a time. And it's pretty tough to kind of find fulfillment and direction if that's the modus operandi. So one really important step is evaluating your mental state. You could say, how am I tilted right now? Zero to 10, where zero is complete calm, collected zen, and 10 is keyboard smashing, furious anger. If you have a better quantitative gauge of how tilted you are, you can follow your plan for that level of tilt. And then the final line of the intro, use gaming as a space to exercise your brain and better regulate its emotional impulses. So we can use gaming kind of like a training ground to improve our own mind rather than let gaming use us as sort of like apes that go on tilt and get really frustrated by circumstances. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So for the assess section, anyone who's in the Discord can feel free to answer some of the questions with how they feel about things. So with compassion, clarity, humility, assess the way your mind thinks about your path. What do you like or dislike about this game? Should we say like first or dislike first? Totally up to you, it doesn't matter. Um, the thing that I really like about the game is how the economy works. I really enjoy that minerals and uh, minerals go up in five and gas goes up in four. And I like doing the little mathematical, uh, I, I don't even want to say like algorithm, but you know, the little maths in your head that you go, okay, I have four gases and three base saturation. I can afford lots of roaches. Or I have two gas geysers and I have three bases. I can make a lot of Ling Bane. So I really like the little maths part that comes with uh, StarCraft. Me too. I kind of compare thinking about the math of StarCraft to taking a difficult calculus course, where when you first arrive in the space, it seems very foreign, and you don't really see the patterns very well. But the more work you put in, the more experience you gain, the more your intuition develops over time. And there is very much kind of a mathematical relationship between how you build and manage your economy and how you spend and manage your army. Period says um, that he really enjoys the struggle. The struggle in StarCraft. I don't know if you're reading as well. Yeah, I saw that. I, yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's definitely a space for expression where you can kind of approach the game in a way that you like. You're not really bound by a particular formula or pattern. You can find what suits you. I find in StarCraft it's a bit hard to, I mean, at least in my games, it's a bit hard to have a struggle because usually there's such a huge advantage from the early game for one player. And if it's a struggle, it usually comes at like someone making a big mistake and evening it out. And, you know, as you play better and better people, you get uh, less people making mistakes. So you just end up with like you steamrolling someone and then you getting steamrolled. At least I've I've been feeling that way a lot of the times. Hmm. From my perspective, it seems like you have that range of sometimes you get totally smashed and sometimes 
you totally smash the opponent, but finding a way to really enjoy those even matches with an opponent, even when you're the one who ultimately loses the game, and kind of appreciating the participation of that opponent. Framing of the opponent is a pretty interesting task for people. I think the default is seeing the opponent as an enemy, maybe even someone who you hate a little bit, because they're potentially bumping you down on the ladder, they're attacking your bases, they're annoying at the very least. And if they beat you, there's a little bit of like bitterness and resentment. Sometimes a lot of bitterness. Yeah. yeah, depending on how the match played out and depending on your previous games against that opponent. So an alternative is to think about the opponent like a teacher who isn't really a coddling, nice schoolroom teacher, but rather someone who is striking at all of your weaknesses. It's an uncomfortable process of learning from an opponent but they definitely will show you where you leave openings by virtue of filling those openings with army and harassment. <clears throat> what I dislike the most about StarCraft 2 is probably sometimes the feeling of helplessness in some situations. Like, um... You open up three hatch before pull, and uh, there's a proxy three gate on the map. Oh no, I didn't scout it. And you, you try, you'll fight for as long as you can, but it always feels like you're slamming your head against the wall. I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but like when those kind of losses come along, it's like, oh no. Mm -hmm. I feel like I just took two steps back rather than, you know, make any progression forward. Yeah, one thing to kind of make sense of is the expected value of a given expenditure and the advantages and disadvantages of a given build. So if you're going through hatch before pool, if you want to play it safe, you would drone scout and maybe check around yeah. for the proxies, but you do sacrifice economy for doing that. If you don't drone scout, you get the most economy, but you're the most vulnerable to 3-gate or 4-gate if it's proxied. One thing that you can make peace with is some players are going to take some really risky moves over the course of a match. Sometimes those will pay off, sometimes they'll fail miserably, and you're one data point kind of on their path. Maybe their build works most of the time. Maybe it only works 40% of the time, but it happened to work against you. Really, it's just another data point for you as well to consider, do I want to open three hatch before pool against this opponent next time? Maybe not. Maybe you could go hatch cast pool and get some lings out a little bit earlier. Opportunity for an earlier roach warren. Sure, there's there's some sort of consideration to take when you go into a game. For me, it's always been if if a build puts me in a situation where I do feel helpless, I typically just change the build. I try to find like one with as few early game holes as possible. But then you get players on the opposite side of the spectrum who go like a three minute nexus type deal and then you're like going, oh, <laughs> you just took just as big of a risk as the proxy three gate. I always feel like, uh, at least on the ladder, I don't feel it in custom games as much because, you know, you know the person. Uh, on the ladder, some people will just take huge risks as in it will, if it gets scouted, it's pretty much a goner type thing. and. It always feels like utter crap when it seems to work on you. You know, and you just think about, oh, in this guy's ladder session, I guess I mm, end up focusing a bit too much on how the opponent sees their own play, you know. Oh, I'm going to open up three Nexus because that's what I do, and I'm going to die 30% of the time because why not? Yeah, another thing that you can bear in mind is people have different preferences for how much they want to take risks. Some people pretty much try and take every risk they possibly can because it's fun and exciting for them. And StarCraft is a space where you can take really big risks and you're only really punished by what happens in the game. Like, it's not quite as bad as gambling really aggressively or like stock market type stuff. You get to engage in a space that's pretty much not for money, it's only for time, 
and for experience, and you could do YOLO drops, you can do proxy, all kinds of different stuff. It seems like the two of us tend to favor more like safe and solid and stable styles where you try and go for the long term of playing safe and getting lots of advantages in economy and tech. Bowman kind of plays similar to that. So you'll occasionally face opponents who take all the risks and sometimes they pay off and it feels kind of silly when it works against you, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just how they've chosen to approach the game. So when when you're up against those, our uh, period brought up a good point first. Uh, he says that the uncertainty actually makes it kind of enjoyable. And I, I think I agree, because you don't want to be playing against the same build over and over and over again. But the thing for me is, is when I go onto the ladder and some person does something like that to me, uh, I don't know like how how do I look at it instead of saying, oh, this person took a huge gamble and it paid off. Do, I mean, I want to look at myself and say, okay, I did this well and this well, even though he went greedy. But it's so hard, because it's so hard to see it. Are you talking about, like, greedy gambles? Oh, I mean, greedy gambles, like proxy DT shrine, you know, proxy double stargate in the middle of the map for no reason whatsoever apart from denying you scouting. Stuff like that. One thing that Day9 emphasized and pointed out pretty well was how scouting is more about ruling out possibilities rather than pinning them down on something in particular. So for the proxy DT example, mainly mm -hmm. you would notice that this Protoss has mined a lot of gas. This Protoss doesn't have a lot of sentries, and I've not been hit by an oracle, and I don't see many adepts running around on the map. What could this possibly mm -hmm. be? It could be proxy Stargate, it could be proxy DT, both of them are kind of similar gas expenditures and similar building placement, you could say. So, kind of not trusting the opponent, always being suspicious and a little bit paranoid is a pretty useful attitude to have in StarCraft, especially when an opponent is not playing straightforwardly. That would be kind of like mm -hmm. the tricky behind the back type of style, where they're not planning on just making a bigger army and beating you in the main fight, so much as trying to hide things from you and strike you with something where you're not going to be prepared for it. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so one question to consider, how do you think about your progress over time? And how do you think about yourself as a player? That sort of mental evaluation is something you carry every day. If it's a more negative tone, it's going to be a lot harder to put in games just because you're kind of getting down on yourself and beating yourself up for your performances rather than feeling like you're gaining something every time. Um, for me in particular, I feel like... Hmm. I guess I always try to, like, focus on what I'm doing as hard as I can. So, like, uh, making sure every single Overlord is built on time. Making sure while harassment is going on, even if he's killing drones, I'm spinning my larva. Making sure that that fourth goes down at six minutes, even though I know he's doing a two-base timing, just because I'm ignorant, right? Things like that. So, when... I feel like I can't just look at myself. It, I feel pretty negative about the entire game. When I have to, you know, exit my own little head and think about, oh, he's, uh, you know, he's another player. It's like, okay, he's also going to be taking some sort of risks as well. Okay. And how do I think about my progress? It's usually if I play that same player again if I identified what I did wrong in the previous game or how I could punish him from the previous game and then I'm able to execute it, I see a little bit of progress in that in terms of just understanding the game as a whole. One thing that Juno actually taught me was when you're playing a game against an opponent, based on how they're moving in the match, think about their intentions and their motivations for what they're doing. 
some players will sort of disclose their attitude to you by the way they're moving their units, even in the earliest stages of the game. So I did a recent highlight analysis of defending a one base Marine Tank Liberator all in from Terran, which is really popular in the legacy meta right now, and how from the very start, the first Marines that you see with your Overlord are moving in an incredibly aggressive way. Not like they're trying to defend their high ground against potential cheese, but they're like rushing down in front of the barracks to shoot the Overlord, which seems like very far what? on the aggressive side of things, yeah. So against opponents, you can kind of think about what you did wrong, but you can also think about the pattern of movement for the opponent over the course of the game. So when you're watching a replay, not just seeing what your mistakes were, but also kind of what your opponent was trying to accomplish. Because they're going to have a game plan as well. And if you understand the reasons for their game plan, you can exploit that a little bit better moving forward. See, that, that sounds very reasonable, but, uh, I mean, you play a lot of ladder games all the time, whereas I don't really expose myself to too many players, on the ladder at least. So it feels like if I look at the game progress uh, game uh, like that and think about, oh, this one player in particular moved his marines out to deny my overlord from scouting so he can do a one base timing. Instead, I'll look at myself and think, there's marines there, he's doing a marine opening, I can, you know, not skip more lings for that reaper or something like that. Hmm. Well, well, you can... And it feels like it's a more of time efficient a uh, way to look at one person rather than each individual person on the ladder. Yeah, a useful way to generalize it though is to think about archetypes of playstyle. So rather than just that player in particular, like an aggro cheesy Terran or a hyper defensive Terran like Avila, you have sort of patterns that emerge in terms of how people prioritize economy and army and which tech paths they choose. So even if you don't face that exact opponent again, if you see someone else of the same race doing something kind of similar, you can mm -hmm. sort of see overlap between the previous track that you encountered and this current progression of action from the opponent. All right, I get that. <clears throat> in the chat play some ladder thinking outside ladder experience has some pretty incredible value a lot of people get lost in the ladder grind and that's pretty much all they do which really causes you to stagnate in your progress over time <clears throat> it's actually a trap that i fell into with streaming during the legacy of the void beta i was just massing games and i wasn't really thinking about cultivating a strong style that could adjust to what different opponents were doing that made a lot of sense. And my mechanics slipped a lot, my basic fundamentals slipped a lot, just because I wasn't really being critical of my play. I was basically massing games, trying a bunch of random stuff, and not really getting anywhere. <clears throat> Yo, can you guys hear me? Hell yeah, Bowman, we can hear yeah. you. All right. Well, I guess that kind of brings up with me. I kind of have a problem too, where it almost feels like gambling when I am on the ladder. Like even if I start doing well, I'm like, oh, I want to play more. I'm doing doing well when I'm playing bad. You know, I I want to kind of get back to at least where I was, right? Yeah, you have a sort of understanding of where you stand in the community, and you want to reach that standard. You don't want to kind of slacken or have a downswing. Well, it's, what, what really gets difficult for me is, especially when I'm in kind of that losing scenario, spending the, the first five minutes in every game just kind of setting up the base. Like I, it's, it's really frustrating, I guess, for me to be in that time just doing the same repetitive thing, especially if I just came from a game but I didn't really like how someone played and I kind of felt like it was a waste of a game or something. And and so, you know, that takes almost maybe 10 minutes and then I've got to spend another five setting a game up. 
I'm coming from a loss and and, and all that. So, uh, and yeah, I guess that's what the the hardest kind of stuff for me to play against is people who are just trying to play to win, and and even just on the ladder, like at, at any time, you never know these people are just going to stop making an economy and just go at you straight. And like, there's what I think is really cool. With Starcraft is you can put on like aggressions and keep going behind it, even when you do really all in stuff. Like I don't feel like there's really that much all inning anymore in legacy like you can do a strategy that's using all of your economy to go into it but at any point it doesn't cost that much money to have 300 400 minerals to make a new base and you know, just quit making the units that you're all inning with once you realize it's time to stop you've done the damage or it's not working whatever and you know go on but i i guess you get some people that, that don't really get that just keep doing stupid you know continuations of it and even even if you go on to win you just kind of wish you would have gotten a better game yeah i definitely really understand what you're talking about that's very similar to how i feel on the letter a lot of times where it's just attacks come out of nowhere like you'll you'll think about the game and you think you understand you know the specific timings that there are like oh he can have plus one attack by now he can have plus one carapace this is when mutas hit but Sometimes it's like, oh, he's, he built like 10 roaches and then built a spire and now he's got mutalisks? What? Like, <laughs> what's going on? I have this is so stupid. And then you'll build the queens and you'll kill the mutalisks. It takes 20 minutes and you win the game. And then it's the next game is like, ugh, do I really want to click again? Do I really want to spend five minutes getting up to three bases just to like face something like that again? I don't know. One thing that I noticed playing with Bowman on the ladder a lot kind of early on in HOTS was you're a high volume player. When you're playing StarCraft you play a lot of games. I'm the same way. I think last season we were both top five in terms of the number of ladder games played on NA server and GM and how if you're going to put in more games you're also going to represent more games when you're playing your worst when you're playing on C game. For a lot of those I kind of think about that as like you're running at a marathon pace rather than a sprint pace. Certain players, especially people who don't have the luxury of time to play for like six hour, eight hour sessions, they'll cheese for like five games. And those five games, they're gonna be trying really, really hard to take the victory and to kill you. And if you're putting in really big volume, you are still improving and you are still working at the game, but you're gonna to die to some of that stuff. And it shouldn't be that surprising. If they really bring that kind of killer instinct, that really aggressive approach to a match, and you're in the middle of a really long session over many games for a season. One thing that I've noticed too, kind of getting to see you stream, Bowman, is when you're on a downswing, kind of thinking negatively about yourself in ways that you could say are objectively false. So. Like, you'll make a mistake, maybe move out prematurely when you have a big advantage. Be like, oh, I'm not a smart man, which is false. Like, you're a very smart person. But you don't feel very smart in the middle of a mistake. <laughs> Mainly, when you're making those mistakes, it's about making them less frequently over time and thinking about the process of learning through experience, which involves discomfort and big blunders and fuck-ups. The one that kind of comes to mind first was a match in arena. You're playing Protoss against a Zerg opponent, and they attack into you. You have a bunch of adepts and like one carrier and a couple archons, and you defend it pretty much perfectly. And it's very clear that the opponent is behind, and you move out across the map, and they just make a ton of hydras and end up cleaning up your army, and the game is basically over with one mistake. Mentally, that's really frustrating, but you can kind of think about the things you did really well leading up to that point and moving forward in the next game being a little bit more cautious and also forgiving yourself, being like, all right, I fucked up. It doesn't mean that I'm a stupid person in general. The opponent pressed the H hotkey to build a bunch of Hydras. Good job, opponent. And I can move into the next game. <clears throat> thought you were about to see a depth for a second there. I was having flashbacks.
But yeah, one of the concepts that's really useful to bear in mind is residual tilt. So it's not just the tilt of making a mistake, it's the tilt that you accrue from a match that you play and you bring into the next matches in your session. So say you start your session, you play a game, it was slightly frustrating, you made some mistakes, you lost to someone who you would normally beat, it feels bad, man. The next game, you start the match, kind of like you said in the first five minutes, a little bit pissed off. You're building your shit, you're taking your nexus, but you don't feel that great about things. If that continues to happen over the course of a session, you'll get progressively more and more mad in the direction of like full QXC keyboard smash type of anger if you were to keep going and having really, really frustrating scenarios. So identifying the small amounts of frustration and making peace with those, addressing those and kind of letting them go will keep you more calm and fresh moving into the next game where you don't already have some negativity that's spilling forward from the previous game, but rather you can kind of start from as close to a neutral zero point as you possibly can. Uh, streaming definitely helps with that, having the first five minutes something to do, you know, talking with people and talking about, you know, your last game and figuring out the wrong points and hearing other people's opinions on it. Yeah, it also, yeah adds, but... it also adds kind of the entertainment value of being able to just hang out with people who can share in the struggle. A lot of times people kind of empathize with the really frustrating scenarios as a broadcaster, where if some really crucial mistake happens and you had a big lead and you lose the game, they kind of feel for you and it's sort of a, a form of support. They don't always do that though. Sometimes people are like, oh, wrecked, that was bad. I cringed. And you're like, sorry, fam. <laughs> One last question in the assessment section is checking the impact of your social interaction. So how other people are influenced by your actions. This includes your ladder opponents that you face and how you engage with them. Reddit activity, talking with other people about StarCraft, and then Twitch chat and your viewers if you're streaming. You'll kind of notice that a lot of people pick up habits from the people they watch. One of the bad habits that I noticed that pretty much every streamer has is as soon as they lose a game, the first thing they look at is how many ladder points they lost, which is probably the least useful piece of information for improvement moving forward. So when people see that, they're like, oh, that sucks, he lost 23 ladder points. And then they go in their ladder games, and they lose a game, and they're like, fuck, I just lost 19 ladder points. That doesn't really help you. If you're Platinum trying to get into Diamond, you should be looking at the workers active. Who had the economy lead? What were the main engagements? Where did I get caught out of position? What could I have done better? So we can move on to the approach section. One thing that you would want to do at the beginning of a session is evaluate your current mental state. You're not always going to be feeling equally focused and equally ready to play every time you have time to play some StarCraft. So you want to make peace with the aspects that subtract from your optimal competitive condition. If you didn't sleep well, if you're drunk off your ass, if you're tired, if you're slightly emotional from some event, that's going to influence your play and subtract from your maximum performance. If you factor that into your expectations and you say, all right, I'm not at my best physically and mentally, so I don't expect to be playing my absolute best games, you'll be less surprised and tilted by losses that you experience and mistakes that you make. Mainly you can simplify your goals and say, all right, if I'm not playing as well, I'm going to aim for some criteria of moral victory, see if I can still practice the style that I'm working on, or do my build correctly, or hit a certain scout timing. Generally, when I'm not really feeling an optimal 
competitive condition, as it says here. I generally just won't play a ladder. How do I just be like, hey, let's do it? Because I, the way I look at it, if I'm not in you know competitive condition, there's no point in really playing ladder because I'm just gonna play badly, and I know it going in, right? Like you said, you have expectations, but I guess my point of view is like, why should I do that? It's just gonna you know, almost feels like a waste of time if I'm not playing very well. A useful thing to set up is a main server and an off server. I don't know if it's harder from. New Zealand, I think, is where you are. But yeah. I'll have NA as my main server and EU as my off server. And if I'm playing a little bit worse, my MMR and EU is like high master. It's not in the GM range, so the opponents are a bit easier. And I'll switch over if I feel like I'm not playing very well. So it's kind of like understanding what your A game sprint pace is like. And if you realize you're just feeling shitty, you're not really doing well on a given day, you just swap over to a little bit less strenuous level of opponents. Do you think that still gives you a good amount of practice? Definitely, yeah. Alright. I'll try Korea again, I guess, with 300 MS. Why not? You confirmed AC server. <laughs> But yeah, you can mainly structure it by defining deliberate goals. So rather than try and get a certain rank or move up the ladder, understanding what you're working on in your play and finding that sense of fulfillment even with 300 MS ping on a different server. <clears throat> a really I mean... important... Go ahead. I was just gonna say, the Korean server usually has a, a more fun games on it anyway. The styles are very focused on the, you know, clear timings and things that they want to do. They have like some sort of thought process going into the game rather than suddenly flicking a switch and going, I'm going to be building a lot of units now and attacking you. Like I seem, I seem to find all the time on NA. One really useful step is to think about the opportunities you have to improve your mentality. Every time you face adversity, every time you get into a shitty scenario that's frustrating as hell, you can improve the way you deal with that. Basically, thinking about being slightly less emotionally affected by the same event over time. So say it's losing to a particular cheese or an all-in. It feels bad, the first time especially. And it feels bad the second time. But if you understand that pattern of this part of the game frustrates and annoys me, how can I frame this in a positive way? One strategy that I've used is if I get cheesed and I lose to a really silly attack in the very earliest stage of the game, think about the perspective of the cheeser. They don't have as much time to play the game, perhaps. Maybe they really like cheesing and it excites them. Great. This opponent got to enjoy a victory. And I can compliment them, and the cheesier they played, the worse I feel, the more flowery the praise I'll give them. And it's a sort of way of venting about the loss in a way that's not destructive and doesn't sort of degrade or discount what the opponent was doing. <clears throat> We already covered the cognitive check-in at intervals between games. Basically at any point in your session you could say, how tilted am I from 1 to 10? If I'm above a 6 or a 7, it's usually when I'll step away and take a short break. If I'm at like a 2 or 3, usually doing replay analysis helps a lot.
probably the gentle with critique part is uh, <laughs> the the hardest to really capture for me at least. After the game, it's always just kind of, damn this, you, this was bad, this was terrible. How how do you go about critiquing yourself, if, you know, accurately, but not you know, constantly putting yourself down? How do you gently critique yourself harshly? <laughs> so mainly that's about critiquing yourself accurately, but it bears in mind the perspective of being a human person we're not robots who well most of us are not robots who can understand a procedure and then execute that perfectly every time moving forward think about it like bruce lee said i fear not the man who has trained a thousand kicks i fear the man who's trained one kick a thousand times or ten thousand times you have to put in a lot of repetitions to achieve consistent accuracy for even a very simple, straightforward move, like a kick. So for StarCraft, if you have something like a build, putting in a thousand repetitions of that build will make it much more refined. But for any immediate execution, there will be a lot of sort of mistakes and muddy spots in it. Moving forward, you want to basically think about how you can polish and sort of sculpt that progression over time to make it better and better. And rather than think about your mistakes as areas where you should get down on yourself and beat yourself up, think about them as parts of your sculpture of your playstyle that you want to sort of chip away and improve upon. And each time you exercise and each time you make some mistakes, you realize those flaws that you wouldn't have mm -hmm. known before you made those mistakes. <clears throat> I guess that's a better. I'm just writing that down. So I'm not really going to be on that much or streaming that much for the next month. But and when I come back, I want to be. You know, I want to approach how I play StarCraft and how I stream better. Um, and so well, part of that is going to be you know, being on more of a schedule, you know, with, with my stream, how much time I kind of allow myself and being most efficient with that time, even trying to be, you know, more efficient than with the time I put in now, you know, not having to waste much of the time that I do now, uh, just by, you know, poor practice or, you know, being upset about it and just kind of grinding through more stuff. So, uh, I guess I just want to bring up whatever you have to say. So uh, the first, or, you know, give tips and, and guards to keeping to the schedule and being efficient. The first thing that comes to mind, you said you'll be away from the game for a couple weeks. You will be rusty and you will play worse coming back. So if you really anticipate that and kind of think about coming back to the game as something where you're enjoying the process of getting the rust off and getting back into the groove of things. You'll sort of circumvent that initial tilt of coming back to the game, you think about where you usually are on the ladder and how you're below that initially. If you're changing your schedule, if you're changing anything about your routine, it's also going to be a little bit more difficult to play the exact same way because you're creating some sort of structure in your daily routine that wasn't there before so maybe allowing yourself some time for your human body and mind to adapt to the different mode of streaming and playing starcraft and thinking about it more for the long game so if you're building a stream it'll take maybe a year of consistent regular high volume kind of hours of streaming to get partner to get into the hundreds range and how each day it's kind of about getting a couple followers here and there. And you have some big streams sometimes, you get some hosts, and you'll understand the balance between the swings of your personal performance and the swings of the quality of stream and how the viewership is behaving. Some days you play really well, but the chat is a pain in the ass. Other days you play like shit and the chat is really encouraging. It can be kind of 
back and forth on either axis and how moving forward you can kind of use that whole experience to improve yourself as a person. You get to strategize and think about the game, think about using your hands with your dexterity and all that and how that's really cool, but also getting to know people and getting to know how you respond to those circumstances. Self-knowledge is kind of the take home that no one can deny you. You can fail at things, you can try for something and not reach your goal, but you will always learn things about yourself. So there is something to gain regardless of how great or shitty your day and your week is going. <clears throat> yeah, there's quite a lot of harassment for regular broadcasters. Lots of different types of it, different volumes depending on the day. So rather than kind of let that get to you too much, you want to think about really what is your goal and focus on that pretty hard. It is emotionally draining, so understanding what your support network is. So if you have friends or family or like a relationship partner or whatever where you can confide in and kind of talk about the frustrating things. Venting is really important and people who don't deal with their emotions kind of carry them moving forward and it becomes like a continually growing weight. I feel like Idra is a good example of someone who basically reached a critical mass of how much emotional baggage he was carrying and hatred for the game and the community to the point where he just exploded and got dropped from his team and then dropped the game when intellectually he was a really gifted player strategically he was one of the best and mechanically he was one of the best but his mentality was the absolute worst aspect of who he was as a player so thinking about that axis of improving your mentality every single day whether you move up or down the ladder you have an opportunity to improve your mentality days when you move down the ladder days when you have a really tough stream are the days when you make the most gains in your mentality, or at least have the opportunity to. It's kind of like putting in a really high stress, long distance run on those days, where you cover a lot of ground and then after the run, your legs are fucked and your lungs are burning and your heart is pounding and you feel shitty and terrible and you're trying to catch your breath. That's all part of the process of growth. One thing I have a difficult time with the StarCraft is even though I, I feel like right now the game and all the players who played are at, at the best it's ever been. Um, you know, a lot of the pro players and also just the regular people you play on ladder or see in smaller tournaments. You know, everyone's just playing really good and the curve of how good you can be is really uh, extended, although I would like it to be able to see, you know, the more, the better player could secure a victory more. Um, but, but another thing, it, well, so that what I was saying is the difficult part is just how it really, there's not a lot of new blood to it, you know, there's not a lot of the circulation in it. Right now it's a very stale kind of game in a way, a lot of the same people and and, you know, Max and Black had that long video, uh, you know, hit on a lot of good points about, you know, the community and how it has become to stand still. Um, and and the, then so all the people who are still into it, it really feels like to me they're all just really into that only. Like a lot of them don't really branch out to a lot of other things and so... I kind of know them as just StarCraft players, and when, I, when I've gone to events, you know, like the people I meet, I just feel like they're really weird a lot of the times. Like, that's that's all, all there really is to, to talk about. Um, I don't know, I kind of wish it was just more of a, like, big social thing like it is in Korea, just kind of like a regular sport. But, I don't know, it's in a pretty, pretty bad spot. It's kind of hard to deal with, you know, being motivated to play but then you still just play it because you love it really so that that it's easy for me because I, I always play it just because i really like it so much but unless something better comes out yeah i definitely kind of 
I feel you on that. One thing that we can kind of look to esports in general is how games sort of stimulate their player base and grow really rapidly. CSGO is a game that was basically on its death rows for a while, and then some major changes came in and it really exploded the player population. I feel like for StarCraft, for us, to bring back the enthusiasts, the people who like the game, but don't really have that daily incremental value, having some rework of daily rewards and like an in-game store, microtransactions, skins, things that players can use to distinguish themselves from other players that are independent of just ladder rank. Basically now the only rewards that you can play for are portrait borders. The thousand solo wins, like that was something people achieved in Wings of Liberty. So anyone who's a reg can pretty much get the thousand solo wins. So it's out of our hands basically to decide when that big change that increases the community size happens. Mainly it's just kind of playing, like you said, for the love of the game, because it's really cool. You can't decide. I really like Zach Tag's video he put up about the ladder system. Yeah, it's definitely a key issue for StarCraft being rewarding as a game for players. Because our win rates are so close to 50%, it feels like you're not really getting anywhere. So having some like daily quests or basic rewards or even in-game currency that you get over time would really offset that balance and make it feel like you're gaining more than you're losing over time. I found that watching that video kind of made me a bit more depressed about everything because I was like, oh, that's how great we could have it, but it's not there yet. Damn. I thought like it just sounded so cool and great on paper. I'm just sad that it, you know, it, it is the way it is. I feel like a lot of the players that have kind of been, I, I don't want to say like stayed behind, but like I'm going to say it anyway. There's a lot of toxicity slowly building up on the ladder right now. I, I haven't even been able to get through a ladder session without at least one person telling me something terrible about my family or this guy telling me I something about my sexuality and stuff like that. And I just, I know it's, you know, pretty common in video games, but I just remember back in Wings of Liberty, it just did not happen that much. And I was playing Zerg with Infestors, right? So it, it's it's kind of sad, and it's, not, it's another um, compounding reason, for me at least, to not click the button sometimes. It's like, oh man, I don't feel like, someone insulting me for three hours. One quote that I heard from someone, I don't know what the original source was. Change happens when the pain to remain the same becomes too great. With StarCraft, basically for us to get an in-game store and for us to get sort of those things we want in the game, we have to be pretty pissed off. Like, the last time Blizzard made a really big change in the way they communicated with the scene, was when the scene was really angry with them. With Legacy coming out, it seems like people have been really happy and excited about the new units, the new expansion, and I think a lot of the toxicity you're talking about is a result of that novelty wearing off. We've done the Nova mission packs, or a lot of people have. We've done the campaign. We've tried out the new units. Now what, basically? Like, what's in front of us? A swarm host change? Is, that doesn't really seem that exciting for the vast majority of players. I, I've almost got the Dark Boys portrait. <laughs> That's something. <clears throat> so, if I can sneak in here for a second, I have a question for you, Nero. Do it. <laughs> also, um, I'm sorry if uh, if this has already been covered. I, I kind of joined the party late. But in terms of reasons that might prevent somebody from wanting to ladder, what about the realization that these games are actually getting hard? The idea that it's becoming less of uh, a casual stroll through the park, make units, and eventually run them over, like 
I'm at the stage now where when I go to ladder, it's intimidating. I know my opponents are actually going to present a legitimate challenge, and it's it's something that I'm I'm having issues getting over myself. I've got a bunch of bonus pool because I'm too scared to hit the button. How do you deal with that? Basically, thinking about how MMR works. If you lose, your MMR goes down, and your next opponent is easier. If you lose many times, your MMR goes down a lot, and your opponents become a lot easier. Over time, sort of reaching that equilibrium of finding opponents who seem like they're an even match for you requires more games for you to put in. The less games you play, the less accurate your MMR will potentially be. So not really expecting to necessarily win games that you play or be able to beat a given opponent, but thinking about each match like a sort of exercise, like you're hitting the gym, you're putting in some reps, and kind of exercising your body, exercising your skills. You're not necessarily going to set a new personal best every time you log into play, but each experience can basically increase your game knowledge, increase the refinement of your mechanics, and allow you to improve your mentality moving forward. So it's kind of like that principle we talked about at the beginning. Rather than be used by gaming and think about it as something that causes your emotions to go up and down and frustrate you, use gaming as a tool to improve yourself as a person. So you can use the StarCraft ladder to take full responsibility for your wins and losses. You can use it to confront anxiety. If you feel ladder anxiety, make your goal for your sessions to play like two games or three games. A really small goal that you can meet and then gradually increase it from there. Increasing your ladder volume is kind of like increasing your endurance for distance running. You would start with a very, very short distance that you know you can reach, and then very gradually increase it from there. Hey, right. so what, cool. what thanks. Think, what do you think is, uh, you know, recently would have been some points for you. Where do you feel like you can take from StarCraft and benefit and and yourself and improve your everyday life? The main factor that's been measured in scholarly journals is cognitive flexibility. There have been multiple universities that have studied how gaming affects the mind. And usually when they'll do a study like this, they'll take a like Sims game, they'll take a shooter game, and they'll take StarCraft pretty much as an RTS game. And RTS players consistently demonstrate gains in cognitive flexibility. And this is people who aren't necessarily long-term StarCraft players. It also includes people who have only just been playing each of those games for a couple weeks at a time. <clears throat> so what is cognitive flexibility? It's basically your ability to change your plans and your course of action on the fly as new information comes in. So when you're in a StarCraft match, you have your build and your strategy as a baseline, but then you have your opponent who's sort of forcing you to adjust your plan and account for different things that you didn't have information of before. <clears throat> I also really like the ability to train your mental endurance, getting to put in lots of volume and also hand dexterity, like you're also a musician, so you can kind of appreciate the interaction between hand and mouse and keyboard and how that all has its basis in the mind and your ability to navigate those movements while also thinking about your moves and your strategies in the game. No, Bowman plays guitar. I play viola. <clears throat> viola? Yeah. One thing that I do before stream is go for a short run up hills. I'm actually wearing my running shorts still because I was a bit short on time. 
but taking 10 minutes to do something physical and wake up the body really helps me kind of balance my like defensive and aggressive approach to StarCraft. If I don't exercise before I play, a lot of times I'll over aggro and attack earlier than I should and take a really bad engagement. One thing that I've noticed Bowman does between his games is like stand up and stretch, which has really good value for engaging your body and making sure you don't get too stale in your posture while you're playing. Man, I want a standing desk. I find when I play uh, on my first ladder game, or just game in general, I'm sitting up straight, arms like, you know, proper, proper positioning. About five minutes into the game, I'm slightly slouched over, leaning back, and I'll catch myself, and I'll be like, alright, better sit back up. And uh, about 10, 15 minutes in, it gets pretty crazy. Don't really catch yourself. Then onto like the second and third game, you just slowly slide down your chair. On like the fourth ladder game, you realize, hey, I can't actually see over my desk. <laughs> so a standing desk could be pretty interesting. <laughs> Doing push-ups can be pretty good too. Push-ups, pull-ups, yoga is pretty dank. But yeah, check out the strategy section in the notes. A lot of these are points that I've identified from giving mentality coaching to people one-on-one. -on -one. It's less like kind of asking questions and evaluating stuff. More, more so it's kind of identifying the patterns and where people struggle mentally in their games. Be patient with the progress of improving your mentality. Redirecting your thoughts is no easy feat. Be true in your assessment and brave in your approach. Use gaming as a tool to make your mentality better and competition as opportunity to exercise your mind.